Today we're going to talk about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. A few years ago, my father-in-law was speaking in a local church, and he was sharing on Matthew chapter 9. In that chapter, there are two blind men who are following Jesus from one place to another, and it takes them, I don't know how many miles to finally get to Jesus' house, but when he gets to this house, they walk in uninvited. And finally, the Lord turns to them and says, Do you really believe I can heal you? And they say, why, yes, Lord. And my father-in-law was reading out of the version that is called the message. And he's reading this, and he said, and then the Bible says, where it normally says, uh, according to your faith, may it be done for you. The verse that he's reading out of the message says, Jesus touched their eyes and said, become what you believe. And when I heard that phrase, I said, now that is a title of a best-selling author right there. That's, that's a title of a best-selling book. So I walked up to my father-in-law. I said, I said, listen, you need to write a book, and you need to call it Become What You Believe. He said, no, I don't have the time. I said, okay, so I did. I recommend that you get a copy of this book. I didn't write it for me. I, write, I wrote it to answer this question. We're going to talk about this question, and we're going to talk about the elements of faith over the next couple of weeks. It answers the question, which is the number one question we are asked as missionaries. Why don't we see or experience the miracles in our country that we hear and see in other parts of the world? Number one question I'm asked. How come the same fires of revival don't happen here? How come the same miracles don't happen here? We're going to answer that because we're going to talk about New Testament faith. We're not going to talk about American faith. We're going to talk about New Testament faith, the faith that moves the hand of God. How many of you would like to have the faith that moves the hand of God? Can I see a show of hands? How many of you would like to experience the miraculous? Can I see a show of hands? Well, I want you to fasten your seatbelt because I believe this is going to be a very enriching time for all of us. And I believe that God desires to pour out the same power, the same revival, and the same miracles in our midst that you hear about in places like Cuba or Argentina or in parts of Asia or Africa. I believe the same God who desires uh, to do those things and does those things around the world desires to do them here. And how many of you would like to see that with your own eyes? Now, if Satan were going to somehow derail this concept of faith, see, God's first language is not English. Y yo sé que vamos a hablar el español cuando lleguemos al cielo. But God's first language is not Spanish either. His first language is faith. Faith is the language we use. You cannot please God without faith. It's the building block of our communication with him is faith. Satan knows that. And so he looked for ways, and he constantly looks for ways to derail this concept of faith. And so approximately 2,500 years ago, during the pinnacle point of a society's influence around the world, he chose one particular individual who has had an unprecedented amount of influence over us. We're going to show you a painting and on the left, you're going to see Plato. Plato is pointing to the heavens. He believed that our existence, our reality, was comprised of two worlds. A perfect world, which is where he's pointing to, heaven. And a world of shadows, an imperfect reflection of heaven. And he believed that you and I lived in the world of shadows, an imperfect reflection of heaven. And he almost had it right. Now Aristotle, his student, is pointing to the elements. He's pointing to the ground. He's a scientist. He believed that we discovered truth by the gathering of empirical evidence. That's, that's how we discover what truth is. That's how we discover what facts are. We gather evidence. And so from Aristotle comes this notion that seeing is believing. And out of these two gentlemen, guess which philosophy won? Guess who is the father of Western philosophy? It is Aristotle who permeated all of, all of Europe and came across on the boats, and that philosophy has embedded itself into our culture. So today we have a separation of church and state. 
You cannot begin a court session by saying to the judge, excuse me, don't you think we should have a word of prayer before we begin today? Or just before we watch that security or that safety video in an, air, in an airplane, wouldn't it be great if we could say, hey, uh, Mr. Pilot, shouldn't we pray over the wings and over the engines? I know we do that anyway when we fly. We cannot take Jesus with us into our workplace. We have to check him at the door. We have to check him at the courtroom door. We have to check him because there's a separation. Gringos have separated. This philosophy, Western philosophy, separates the natural from the supernatural. There is a division between the two. And so if you want to experience the miracles of God the very first thing you have to do is you have to realize, just like those who live in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and those who live during the New Testament, you cannot separate the natural from the supernatural. The demons and humans, the material and the supernatural, all coexist in the same continuum. The very first thing that those people around the world who experience miracles have is a holistic paradigm when it comes to that which is our reality. They see demons and they see the material all in the same continuum. That's why in Mexico, for example, if some kid who lives in a secular home gets sick, they're just as likely to take that kid to a witch doctor as they are to a medical doctor because it could be a spiritual problem. Notice what Paul says. Someone who is highly educated, someone who is very left brain. He recognizes in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And we demolish arguments of every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I can take you to Cuba, I can take you to Argentina, I can take you to different parts of Africa, Asia, and I can tell you those people who experience the miraculous have a very, 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 very small puzzle that they call life. And Jesus is the biggest piece of that very, very small puzzle. But in our culture, we have a huge, complex, overwhelming puzzle and Jesus has become a very small, almost insignificant piece of a very complex puzzle. So if you want to experience the miraculous, you've got to make Jesus a bigger part of your life. He's got to be the biggest piece of your puzzle. Second of all, the second element, second characteristic of those who experience the miraculous is they have a profound honor and respect for those who are in spiritual authority. Now, I notice that no one shouted amen, and I'm not taken by that because no North American or gringo ever shouts amen when I say that because we tend to be a rebellious nation. That's the way we are. We're wired to be rebellious. We were born out of a rebellion. We threw, see, there we go. We got an amen. One amen back there. Yeah. We threw a fit over one-nineteenth the taxes they were paying in England. Think about it. The Revolutionary War started over one-nineteenth of the taxes that they were paying in England. And because of that fit, 80,000 people died during the Revolutionary War. Matter of fact, we dislike authority so much, people are not moving towards Washington, D.C., in case you haven't figured it out. The West Coast is getting more and more people. Why? Because they can't get away from Washington fast enough. Thank the Lord for the Pacific Ocean. Otherwise, they'd be in China by now. People are moving away. They don't want to be told what to do. I won't ask you what your opinion is of the President of the United States. I won't, I won't ask you what your opinion is of Congress or the Supreme Court. I won't ask you what your opinion is of the governor of the state of California. And I won't ask you what your opinion is or what the thoughts that go through your mind when you get pulled over on the freeway for doing 80, 80, uh, 72 miles an hour or whatever it is. I can tell you what goes through my mind if I get, get pulled over by a CHP officer. Uh, you know, why aren't they pulling over real criminals? Why are they picking on me? Or perhaps you might be saying, oh, we know that the state of California is bankrupt. And they need money, so they all got together in a little meeting today and said, how many people are you going to pull over today? 
We question authority and we lower those who are in authority. We do this, we bring them down, and this spills over into the way we view spiritual leadership. So that pastor just becomes one of the guys. We reduce those who have spiritual authority just like they did to Jesus. And when you do that, you do no longer see the miracles. When he went to his hometown, the Bible says that they saw what he did and say, isn't that the carpenter's son? And don't we know his brothers, his sister? Don't we know his family? And the next words out of his mouth is, the authors of that, of that gospel say he, that for that reason, he couldn't do any miracles except for heal a few people because of their lack of respect. No, because of their lack of faith. Quating faith with this notion of respect, you see. The Bible says in Luke chapter 7, talks about this concept of respect. It says, when Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And there a centurion servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with him. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent some friends to him. All of a sudden, the centurion had a change of heart. Jesus was on his way. The leaders of the Jewish community had convinced him to go. They were on their way. And all of a sudden, he sends a second dispatch of people, some friends, to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. For that is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. Notice what he says. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes, and I tell my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in the entire city of Whittier. And the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Notice that Jesus did not say, I have not seen such great respect. He did not say, I have not seen such great honor. He said, I have not seen such great faith. And notice that Jesus is not talking about an Israelite. He's talking about a foreigner. Which is one of the reasons why these half, half of my audience, by the way, in case you don't know, I have a program on Radio Nueva, half of my audience is illegal. Half of my listening audience is illegal. And yet, if I need someone to pray and move the hand of God, I call one of them. These illegals that come over have a wiring in their head where they just believe God for the miraculous. They haven't been law here long enough to be contaminated by our unbelief. Simply put, Aristotle's influence over them has not taken place. So when they come into this country, when they are in the countries of their, of their original homeland, whether it's Cuba, Asia, they haven't been affected by this Aristotelian mentality. And oh, by the way, they do respect those who have spiritual authority. They do they do show honor to those who have spiritual authority. And I'll tell you why. Because what comes around goes around. I know what you're saying. First of all, I do not pastor this church. I love this church. This church has supported me. But I do not pastor this church. But if I want to convince you to experience the miraculous, this point is so important that you show that kind of respect to your spiritual authority. Why? Because what comes around goes around. If you want to have rebellious kids then do not model honor and respect for your kids. How many of you would say when you went to school there was more respect in the classroom back then than there is today? Can I see a show of hands? Let me tell you what, what comes around goes around, ladies and gentlemen. 
You want to have a wife that respects you? You need to show some respect. You need to be worthy of that respect. You want to have children respect you? You need to show and you need to model that respect for them because if you don't, who will? And if you want to walk in the power and the miracles of God, you have to recognize a spiritual pecking order. Sometimes it does take a foreigner to recognize a spiritual pecking order in a location. So I want to encourage you from the depths of my heart, don't be resistant to this word. Embrace this word, and God will exalt you. He will lift you up, and he will give you the respect that you deserve if you model that for those who are around you. I was invited to speak at King of Kings Church, which is Claudio Freysen's church in Argentina. It was a few years ago, and I had flown 7,000 miles to get to Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires is further south than South Africa. So when I get there, the, the, the missionary that picks me up says, Claudio wants to have lunch with you today. He wants to talk about the campaign. It's a two-night campaign we're going to have in Claudio's church. Great. So I go to the church. I hadn't slept all night. You know, get to the church. Claudio sits me down, and he says, um, I'm going to tell you three things regarding uh, the campaign that's coming up. I said, what is it? He said, first of all, we're going to start Tuesday night. Okay, now I've done lots of campaigns. As you know, the worst night of the week to start a campaign is Tuesday night. It's the worst night of the week. But he's Claudio. He pastors 30,000 people. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Right? He said, second of all, I'm going to begin to announce it on Sunday. I said, you, you haven't even announced it yet? You haven't even announced it yet? He said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He said, one other thing. I said, what's that? He says, I'm not going to be there. I said, ah. You're not going to be there? He said, don't worry about it. I said, okay, well, listen, I got a radio program. I need to come by the church on Tuesday. Can you have the driver pick me up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? That way I can go and I can interview a few people. And after I interview a few people, I can go back to the hotel and get ready for the service that night. Not a problem because I want to upload their testimonies to the server. Not a problem. So the driver picks me up at 2 o'clock. I go to the church. I give you a few people, few people, and I walk out the church. It's like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I walk in out of the church, and there's a long, there's a 500 people standing in line in front of this church under the pouring rain. The pouring rain, and the driver's got an umbrella over me. And uh, I said, uh, what are these people doing here? He goes, you mean the people standing in line? I said, yeah, what are they doing there? He goes, they're standing in line. I said, I know they're standing in line. Why are they standing in line? He said, they're waiting for the campaign to start tonight. I said, the campaign that we're beginning tonight at 8 o'clock? I said, it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He said, by the time the campaign starts, there will be 2,500 people lined up here. Now, as I walk by that line, I do have a shred of wisdom. Not much, but a shred. So I kept my mouth shut, but I was thinking to myself, as I was walking by that line, looking at those people under the pouring rain, I thought to myself, I know the guy who's coming to preach tonight. And I wouldn't be standing in line to hear him. <laughs> and I like him. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I like the guy. He's a nice guy. Four hours in the rain, I'm not sure about that. The Lord spoke to me and said, they're not here to hear you. They're here to hear me. They're not here to hear you. They're here to hear me. There is a spiritual pecking order that one must fall into. So I went back to the hotel room and I asked God to give me his word, not my word, his word, for these people who are seeking him, not me. Because as they honor me and they show God respect, guess what happens? Miracle happens. Miracles happen. The service began that night at 8 o'clock. What time did they pick me up at the hotel? 8 o'clock. I get to the church, there's no way. There's no way to even walk in the front door. The lobby had 500 people packed into that lobby. A security team is around me, and they are literally escorting me through this conglomeration, this multitude of people that are in the lobby. The sanctuary is packed to capacity. There's 2,500 people in the sanctuary. Ambulances, two of them, had gone by the children's hospital to pick up children that were on their deathbed simply because their pastor had announced that we are going to pray and believe God for healing. And brought these kids to that altar call. Fifty people in wheelchairs that night. I had prayed, I don't know how many hours, maybe two, maybe three hours, and at the end of the service, they took me into the green room. Forty-five minutes later, I come out of the green room. There are still 500 people in the sanctuary waiting for me to pray for them. 
So I said to the security team, I said, well, shouldn't we pray for these people? He said, no, they can come back tomorrow. I said, well, that's a little, a little abrupt, don't you think? He said, no, no, we got to sweep the sanctuary. I go, what do you mean sweep the sanctuary? Because we have to do a security sweep of the sanctuary. I said, what are you talking about? He says, we have to crawl under every pew, and we have to make sure that no one is hiding under any pew, and then we have to go into the bathrooms, and we have to open up every stall because they'll close the stall door, close the toilet lid, in hopes that when somebody looks under the thing, they don't see anything because they want to be the first people in church the next day. I said, yeah, we got the same problem in the United States. Honor and respect not only for the servant of the Lord, but for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. They have a profound respect for the presence of God. A profound respect and honor for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And thirdly, there's ten characteristics. We'll talk about these characteristics over the coming weeks. But thirdly, is the sense of urgency and desperation that they have around the world far super exceeds ours. We, we have lost really what, what urgency and desperation is. We have what we call first world problems. We have first world problems. You know what a first world problem is? A first world problem is, for some reason this text will not go through. Everyone else has a smartphone, mine's a dumb phone. That's a first world problem. We become desperate for things that the rest of the world has a very difficult time dealing with. My mom was telling me just two days ago that she was sitting in a board meeting in her homeowners association where they were arguing for three hours whether it should be Cox Cable or Time Warner. These are first world problems. We have POSs, PPOs, HMOs, and some of you even have GTOs. We have life insurance, health insurance, dental insurance, car insurance, renters insurance, fire insurance, and we can even take out different policies on our body if we so desire. You can ask Dolly Parton. This is, this is meant to eliminate an, ur an urgency. You know, we live in a blessed nation. Thank the Lord that Somebody like Keith Richards, the, the, the guitarist for Rolling Stones, can take out an impolicy on his fingers if he wants to. Thank the Lord he's got that option. But while we are a blessed nation and we have set up firewalls around us to protect us, that creates less dependency on the Lord. And when you create a system that is less dependent on God, you can expect to see less miracles. You can expect to see fewer miracles. You can expect to see God's intervention happen less because he says, you got it all under control. And we think, well, if God doesn't show up, then I guess I can just go to the hospital. I can go to Cox, or I can go to Kaiser, or I can go to the Minute Clinic. Got lots of options. 1.2 million applications. And they will do everything in life you need. Menos cambiar la suegra. Es la única cosa que no van a hacer. <laughs> I won't translate that. The rest of the world doesn't live that way. A woman with an issue of blood. In Mark chapter 5, if Jesus did not show up, she's toast. God doesn't show up in Cuba, they're toast. Doesn't show up in China, they're toast. This group, ISIS, that is beheading Christians, let me tell you what, if, if the Lord doesn't show up, they're toast. They have no options. And when you get to that level of, of urgency, your faith begins to move the hand of God. Begins to, when you have no options. Now, the beautiful thing about this is that you can have a hundred million dollars in the bank and you can still choose to be desperate for God. You know that? You can have a hundred million dollars in the bank and you still choose to be desperate for God. Peter had boats. He had a fishing company. He had his wife. He had a house. He had everything. He had people working under him. And yet when asked the question, are you guys taking off? Are you going to leave me as well? When Jesus exploded, Peter says, where else can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. 
he understood that ultimately his life was in the Lord's hands. Four men who loved their friends so much, they went by, picked him up, carried him on a cot, carried him I don't know how many miles, got to a place. They had heard Jesus was there. They heard he was teaching. They believed that God would do a miracle in his life. When they got to this house, they saw that the place was completely packed. There were six, seven people deep trying to look through the windows, couldn't, get a, couldn't find a way to get into that house. And when they saw the multitude of people, they threw in the towel and said, forget it. Right? No, what happened? One of the guys said, you know, I think the owner of this house needs a skylight. We should make a skylight for this guy. That's what they did. They hoisted up that body, nothing heavier than dead human weight. Let me tell you, the human body, when it's lifeless, is heavier than any other material out there. And they somehow got the guy up onto the roof, and they ripped up the roof and lowered it right before. And the Bible says, when Jesus saw their desperation, no. When he saw their urgency, no. When he saw their faith. Second way that Jesus defines faith. When he saw their faith, he turned to the paralyzed guy and said, your sins are forgiven. Now, I can imagine the paralyzed guy saying, well, you know, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. In case, in case you haven't figured it out, that's not why I'm here. But the Lord wanted to do the miracle. The Lord wants to do the miraculous. He always does. His heart is always for those who suffer. I don't care what kind of baggage you came in the door with this morning. I want you to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that if you have suffering in your heart, God's heart is with you no matter how you feel about yourself. He always has compassion on those who suffer. And he wanted to do a miracle in this young man, but he couldn't because of the sin that was there. And so he had to first remove the barrier before he could do the miracle. Sometimes God doesn't do the miraculous in our life simply because there is a sin or there is sin in our lives that must be removed. And so that's why he says, son, your sins are forgiven. With that, all of a sudden, Luke's attention and all the things that, that are developing in the story is diverted because of a religious group that rises up in opposition and begins to say things like, who can forgive sins but God alone? This man is blaspheming. And now Jesus has to put out this fire. The same thing happens in our churches across the nation. The Spirit of God wants to move. He wants to bind up the brokenhearted. He wants to heal those who are suffering. He wants to bring salvation to that house that is lost. But he can't because there's a group of religious people that are too concerned about the air conditioner or perhaps mad about the music or the style of the music or the fact that we don't have enough hymns or too many hymns or it's too fast or too slow or the sermon's too long or too short or that person's got a new tattoo or that person's wearing this or that or whatever it is that they're interested in. They're talking about everything else but the central, America, uh, central message of the gospel. And so the Lord finally turns to this group of people and says, just so that you know that I have the authority to forgive sins, he turns to the paralyzed man and says, I want you to get up, pick up your mat and walk. He throws the mat over his shoulder and he walks out in front of all and everyone breaks out into applause. They begin to worship the Lord. Even the Pharisees are standing there with their mouths wide open. And in the meantime, there are four individuals who are looking through a hole in the roof, watching their friend for the very first time stand up and walk out a door. Urgency and desperation moves the heart of God. I close with this final illustration. We had our first campaign, first night. Gave an invitation for people in a marginalized, impoverished community to come forward to receive healing. The very first person that is coming forward is a little eight-year-old. She's an eight-year-old little girl, and she's being, well, she wasn't the first person. But she was going to become the first person because her grandmother is pushing her through the crowd to the front. Now, in case you don't know this about Latin culture, if you are a grandmother in Latin America, you are just below Jesus. There's Jesus and then their grandmothers. So this grandmother is pushing this kid to the front. I lean down and I say, well, hi, sweetheart. I said, what can I do for you? Immediately, her grandmother interrupts and says, she's missing three ribs. We need a miracle. 
We don't have the money. We took her to the clinic er, er, earlier today. She's missing three breaths. She's going to be an invalid. She's not going to be able to walk. We, we need a miracle because we don't have the money for the operation. So we came, so you pray because we need a miracle. I thought, well, there's no pressure. <laughs> so I leaned down and I said, well, sweetheart, I said, do you believe the Lord can heal you? And she was just trembling. She, I said, okay. I said, let's pray. So we prayed. And after, I don't know, few minutes, I continued on because there was 299 other people to pray for that night. So the very end of the night, I feel somebody tugging on my jacket. I turn around, and it's this little girl, Vivian. I said, well, hi, Vivian. I said, what can I do for you? She said, I believe the Lord has healed me. Now I heard four, five amens. Four or five amens, which is pretty good, actually. Let me tell you how they respond in Cuba when I say, yo creo que Dios me ha sanado. When I use the phrase, I believe God has healed me, you know how they respond in Cuba? Hallelujah! Gloria a Dios! Amen! That woke you up. As it would if you were sitting there in Cuba. Respond the same way in Africa and respond the same way in Asia. You know how we respond in Gringolandia? Oh. Now, I'm not a fool. I know what oh means. Do you know what it means? It means seeing is. See, you're all Aristotle disciples here this morning. Now, I don't want you to feel bad. Because when Vivian said to me, Yo creo que Dios me ha sanado, I went, oh. <laughs> Let me just say, first of all, I am your friend. I'm your brother. And we are all in a war for faith. We're all in a war to believe God for the miraculous in spite of the evidence that points to the contrary. We're all in the same boat. For some reason, the enemy has targeted Western Europe and the United States, and for us it is not easy to just simply believe. So she says to me, I believe that God has healed me, and I look over to the left, and there is a doctor there. So I walk over to the doctor, and I said, Hey, doc. I said, I know we're wrapping up this campaign tonight, but I said, there's a little girl here. He says, oh, hey, that's Vivian. She came to my clinic earlier today. He says, you know, she's missing three ribs. Unless we operate her, she's going to be an invalid. I said, well, she tells me she's received a miracle. He said, well, that would be very obvious because she had a huge gaping hole in her back where those three ribs are missing. I said, would you mind checking her out? He said, not a problem. He walked over. He asked her permission. She was in agreement. She bent over. He lifted up her shirt. He started to count by twos her ribs. And when he got to the middle portion of her back, he took a step backwards. He said, that's not the same back that I looked at earlier today. Because where there's a huge gaping hole, I see three brand new ribs. It sounds a little bit more like Cuba right here, ladies and gentlemen. Sound a little bit more like Cuba. Ten years had passed. We were in the largest soccer stadium in the country. Ten years later. Wanted to see 10,000 people show up that night. We had a torrential downpour that afternoon. 6,000 people showed up. I was bummed out that we only had 60% of those that we wanted. I got up and I preached. I gave an altar call. Lots of people came forward. And out of that group, I see a figure emerging shooting past these ushers, jumping over a concrete barricade, got past the armed guards, and shot up the side steps as walking towards me on the stage. And I look over at the armed guards, and they're like, I said, excuse me, can I help you? She said, it's me, it's me. I said, I don't know who you are. Who are you? She said, it's me. Don't you recognize me? I said, no, I don't. She said, it's me, Vivian. I said, Vivian. I said, you're, you're, you're all grown up. And, and, and running and jumping over barricades. And I said, what are, you, what are you doing here? She said, you know, a bunch of us were up in Los Cuadros. That's that marginalized community. We decided we'd come down in a bus. 
and support the event. When I heard you preach, she said, I just felt like I needed to just share some of the great things that God has done. She said, would you please let me have the microphone? And I said, I said, please. You know, I don't know, friend, where you are or what you're going through. But I know that the Lord is faithful. And that he blesses those. And he always helps those. And intervenes in the lives of those who suffer. You might have an ingrown toenail. Or you may be facing the greatest trial of your life. And I've come to tell you today, become what you believe. Become what you believe. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask that you would do the miraculous. You meet every one of us right where we're at. And I pray, O oh God, that you would break every one of those strongholds, every one of those issues of bondage that keep us tied down, that keep us in preventing us from moving forward. So I ask right now, Lord, that you would release the oppressed, bind up the brokenhearted, give sight to the blind, give hope to the hopeless, raise up my friend who has fallen, and those who feel that for some reason they need an answer to come today, or if not today, this week, or this month, or this year, something must happen. I ask, Lord, that that something do ha does happen, and that it would happen, and that you would receive all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name.